Calling all cars. A Rio Grande presentation. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 58. Stand by for review of preceding broadcast covering murder, bank holdups, and dynamiting. That's all. Rolls and quit. Two police officers cruising about their territory tonight in a radio patrol car have as their guest a representative of the Rio Grande Oil Company who is getting first-hand information for the next broadcast of Calling All Cars. Let's listen in. Hey, it's sure good to see the new year come in. 1934 wasn't such a good year for us all. Well, not for all of us, maybe, but so far as Rio Grande was concerned, 1934 was a splendid year. You mean to tell me that you sold more of that Rio Grande crack gasoline last year? I understood most companies are losing business. Oh, no, sirree. Crack gasoline sales have been growing month after month. Well, we've more than doubled our sales. Well, you got a mighty fine gasoline, no question about that. We wouldn't be using Rio Grande cracked in our police cars if it wasn't the finest that the city could buy. Yes, more police cars in California and Arizona are using Rio Grande than any other gasoline. But you know, most of our business comes from new customers, motorists who want to get police car performance in their cars. I imagine that calling all cars radio program creates a lot of new customers for you. Yes, that's right. Nearly every listener is driven in for, to a Rio Grande station to try crack gasoline, and they stick with us. Rio Grande has a mighty loyal following, and the company tries to show its appreciation by giving better broadcasts every week. It is a special program on the night. Let's listen to it. During the year just past, you have heard broadcast on this program many cases from the police files of Oakland, San Jose, San Diego, Tucson, and other western cities, as well as cases from the files of the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight, we ask you to look back over the past year as we review memorable scenes from Calling All Cars for 1934. In every case of violence and law-breaking, which you will hear re-dramatized on tonight's program, bear in mind that the criminal paid the full penalty prescribed by law. We Westerners have a great tradition to uphold, and the blood of the vigilante seems to flow in our veins. For out here, we have shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that crime does not pay. Do you remember Tom White, the rattlesnake bandit, and his blonde wife and partner in crime, Burma? The very evening that newspapers screamed the headline story that she was on her way to Tehachapi, calling all cars broadcast the dramatization of her career in crime. Yes? How do you do, ma'am? We're police officers, and we'd like you to help us. Why, why, come in. Is anything wrong? What can I do? We're looking for a blonde who lives in this building. A blonde? Well, there are several blondes here. Yeah, who are they? Well, now, there's Miss Arnold. What's she like? Well, I wouldn't want it to go any further, but she's heavy. In fact, she's fat. Yeah, yes. that's, that's not the one. Who else? Well, then there's Miss Gilman. She's 40 if she's a day, though she tries to tell people she's only 32, you know. She's... Well, well, that's not the one. Oh, yes. Uh, there's young Miss Adams. Hasn't been here very long. Now, what's she like? Well, she's just a child, about 19 or 20, slim and pretty in a way. That's the one we're looking for. What apartment is she in? In 218. Now, look here. I don't want any trouble in my place. Really. Well, there won't be any trouble. You just stay right here in your apartment. <laughs> Detectives Burris and Bergeron called Detectives Anderson and Maxwell in from the alley. And with guns drawn, climb the stairs to apartment 218. They find the door unlocked. That's her. Grab her, Burris. Hey, Andy. There's that guy down the hall. We're police officers. Get him up. The hell with you. What are they doing? Killing Tom? No, Burma. He just committed suicide by pulling a gun on an officer. Tom White went to a gunman's grave, and Burma White to Hatchapi Women's Prison for from 30 years to life. But this sort of expiation can never bring back the sight of Miss Cora Withington, who was blinded by brutal Tom White's murderous gun. 
Los Angeles police calling all cars, attention all cars. A bombing at the Los Angeles Times building. It is one o'clock in the morning of October 1st, 1910. While the city sleeps, a band of men who toil by night and rest by day is working at top speed. From the far corners of the world, another page of history's book has been assembled. The morning paper is going to press. In the composing room on the second floor of the Times building, a line of men, green eye shades clamped to their heads, clatter at the linotype machines. In the engraving room on the sixth floor, mercury lamps throw their ghoulish glare. The dog watch in the city room sleepily eyes the clock, hoping that no big story will break to disturb their somnolent ease until 30 comes for them at half past four. Seated by their silent telegraph keys, two men stand by in the wire room for last minute news flashes. In the basement, the huge presses hungrily await the plates for the final edition. Horses and wagons stand ready in the alley to dash away with the ink wet edition to carriers all over the city. That Los Angeles may have her news with her morning coffee. The hands of the clock slowly move on. Activity increases as press time approaches. It is now 1 5, 1 6. In Ink Alley, by the press room, another clock ticks ominously, unnoticed by any of the busy workmen in the building. The seconds pass. The clock says 1-7. And then... Ten miles. The center of the Times building blows up. The force of the explosion snaps the girders supporting the second and third floors as so many toothpicks. Down into the gaping hole hurtle the heavy linotype and stereotyping machinery, carrying their operators to a crushing death. The gas main which feeds the building is ripped open and instantly ignited. A searing fountain of flame leaps through the building. Within a moment, the entire structure is ablaze. Workmen clutched in the freezing maws of horror rush to the fire escapes to be met by a fiery wall, through which escape is an impossibility. The two telegraph editors trapped in the room slowly burn to death. Compositors and linotype operators, horribly maimed, arms torn off and legs broken, lie helpless on the floor as the vicious fire creeps toward them. Their pitiful cries reach the street below, where all the downtown fire apparatus has already arrived. But rescue is an impossibility. No man can enter that seething funeral pyre and live. The reporters and editors on the dog watch in the city room on the third floor are forced to jump to the street. Those who survive the jump are crippled for life. Within a few minutes after the explosion, the last cry of the helpless victims trapped within the building has been smothered as the fever to embrace the flames. In an astonishingly short time, the entire building is gutted. And then a new danger threatens. As one after the other, the walls, lacking any support, sway. Potter and Christ to the street, where a huge crowd of citizens, hurled from their beds by the explosion, are straining at the hastily rigged guard ropes. All night long, the fire rages, completely ruining the plant of the Times. Yet just a little later than usual the next morning, the Times is delivered to its subscribers, printed at an emergency plant by the battered, bruised, and bandaged survivors of the catastrophe. Before the last smoldering ember has died away, the law swings into action. Sam Brown, chief of the district attorney's investigators, and William J. Burns, world-famous detective, team together in a manhunt which extends halfway across America before the McNamara brothers, arch-terrorists, are run to earth and sentenced to life imprisonment. <laughs> Captain Chitwood of the Los Angeles Narcotics Squad was one of the big heroes of calling all cars in 1934. He it was who posed as a dope peddler and met with three wily Japanese high on the top of a hill. His problem was to get the goods on the Orientals and then arrest them and bring them into headquarters. 
He took his life in his hands. Under his threatening revolver, Captain Chitwood forces the three Japanese to bring the dope up and put it in his car. Although he watches his captives with great care, he cannot but feel the constant threat of Koto's great strength. As the car is loaded finally, he orders the three into the car. In your work, Mr. Jordan, you do not make a great deal of money. Well, it's not very much according to your standards. A sum such as $10,000 would be quite large in your eyes. It would be very large. I happen to have such a sum within easy reach. You'll be able to hire a good lawyer with it. I was thinking of making a friend a present. A very lucky man, I should say. You are the friend, Mr. Jordan. And how do I merit this friendship? Your return to the police station with the sad news that your suspects disappeared. Sorry, Count, that's out of my line. Ten thousand dollars is a lot of money. No, you better get in the car. Back there, Kodo. Mr. Jordan, I will give you one more chance. There are three of us. Koto here is a trained wrestler. We all know jujitsu. Once we are in the car, you will be unable to manage us. True, you have a gun, but you cannot succeed in getting us to the city. I've been thinking about that. Oh, I think uh, you had better accept the uh, Count's offer. It is impossible you will arrive in town alive. Let's put it another way. Let's say that it is impossible that all of us will arrive in town alive. I do not quite understand. It's very simple, really. Don't you see that Koto is the main threat? How much do you weigh, Koto? Two hundred, ten. When you, Count, and Huashi here are carrying Koto through the fields down to where I can call a police car, you won't be very dangerous. But why should they carry me? Because I'm going to kill you. You cannot do that. My dear fellow, I can and will do exactly that. Koto, unfortunately, resisted arrest. My duty as a police officer, although unpleasant, was very plain. I had to shoot him. The law is quite explicit on that point. But I am not resisting arrest. Oh, you have no imagination, Koto, huh? Who will ever know? Oh. You will not do this thing. It is fantastic. Just to show you that my gun is loaded, gentlemen, and that I mean what I say. Please, must be another way. Uh, we plead with you, Mr. Jordan. We have been very fair. We have offered you money. Wilt, you will not take it. But that is no excuse to murder one of us. I have no desire to kill, but there is one other way. What, please? Koto will lie on the floor of my car. You two will lie on top of him with your hands at my side. If you make a false move, I'll shoot all of you. If you don't, you'll arrive safely at the station. We accept. Into the car, then. And watch your step. This gun is liable to go off in my hand by mistake. One hand on the wheel, the other covering his uncomfortable prisoners, Captain Chitwood transported the dope smugglers to police headquarters. They were speedily tried and speedily sentenced to two and a half years in the federal penitentiary in Leavenworth for violation of the Harrison and Jones Miller Narcotic Act. Since serving their time for that offense, the Count has been sentenced to Folsom on a verdict of first-degree murder. Koto has returned to Japan, and Awashi is a fugitive from justice, having jumped a bond on a forgery charge. The murder of a soul, broadcast 29 of Calling All Cars, marked an experiment in the introduction of psychological drama into radio. For weeks, distraught Marie Trentini broods over the fickleness of her cousin Vincenzo and the brutal frankness of Gaetano, his brother. For weeks, behind her impassive, saddened face, her brain is in a turmoil, trying to adjust herself to the outrage she feels has been done her. And then, finally, on August 7th, 1928, as Marie lies tossing sleeplessly in her bed, something in her brain snaps. The turmoil of thought and counterthought lines up into one straight, clear path of action. Marie slips from her bed, tiptoes into the front room, takes Gaetano's shotgun from the closet and silently walks toward the bedroom in which her cousin and his wife are sleeping. I love him, Gaetano. You couldn't make him marry me. It would be all right once I had him. 
He would have learned to love me. I would have made him a good wife. Better than any of those little flap. You could have done this for me. But you wouldn't, Gaetano. You laughed at me. You told me I was old and fat. But I'm a good inside, Gaetano. I had a soul. I had a feelings. You don't know about that. You don't know that you were killing me. You were killing my soul. So you were killing me. But see, Gaetano. My body is not dead yet. My body can still kill you, Gaetano. That is a fear, isn't it, my cousin? You kill my soul. I kill your body. You see how my body still lives, cousin Gaetano. How it lifts this gun to my shoulder. I would have put my finger on the trigger. I... <laughs> Marie Trentini established an alibi to the police, but Captain Barlow, police fingerprint expert, discovered her prints on the gun. Confronted with this damning evidence, Marie, excusing herself for a minute, stepped into an adjoining room and slit her throat. September 26, 1933. Under a hail of machine gun bullets, Charles Mickley, Harry Pierpont, and Russell Clark, accompanied by seven other convicts, successfully escaped from the Indiana State Penitentiary. As the ten desperate criminals disappear into the mists of early morning, all Indiana awakens to a reign of terror. Two days later in Lima, Ohio... You the sheriff? Yes. Well, you're holding John Dillinger here? Yes. Uh, we've come to get him. Who are you? Officers from Michigan City, Indiana. He's wanted there. Uh, you'll have to show me your credentials. Here's our credentials! <laughs> Terror spreads throughout the Middle West. Hysterical fear mounts. Not since the days when Jesse James rode the prairies. How respectable citizens lived in mortal dread of a ruthless outlaw. Dillinger is loose! Indianapolis. $21,000 taken from the Massachusetts Avenue Bank. New Carlisle, Ohio. And it's taken to $3,000 from the New Carlisle Bank in daring daylight robbery. Farrell, Pennsylvania. Hold up in the Farrell Bank. Lost $24,000. Daleville, Indiana. Hold up and lost $3,500. Mount Pelier, Indiana. $12,000 haul from the Mount Pelier Bank. Racine, Wisconsin. Hold up the American Bank and Trust Company. Lost $27,000. Greencastle, Indiana. $74,000 bank robbery. East Chicago, Indiana. Hold up for the First National Bank. $20,000 stolen. One policeman murdered. Such is the list of crimes attributed to the Dillinger mob. Federal authorities combine forces with state and local peace officers. Roads are blocked. The militia is called out. Then, as suddenly as it began, the reign of terror ends. Peace once more reigns in the Middle West. The shattered nerves of farmer, merchant, and banker gradually return to normal. Dillinger seems to have disappeared from the face of the earth. A pale desert moon casts its transparent coverlet over the jagged crest of Mount Lemon. From a sandy wash, a coyote howls at the silent Sahara that broods above him, thrusting its spiny arms toward the star-speckled velvet dome overhead. Across this scene of beautiful desolation comes a discordant note, a tinny popular song played by a three-piece orchestra in a desert roadhouse. The place is a few miles from Tucson, Arizona. It is the night of January 24th, 1934. Here, Clark, the Dillinger henchman, boasts to a couple of traveling salesmen about his prowess with a machine gun. Three days later, the Dillinger gang is in the Pima County Jail, and a week later are transported to Indianapolis. But Dillinger bluffs his way out of the Michigan City Jail and the reign of terror begins again. Then, late in July, the trail once more grows hot. Tipped off that Dillinger will attend the Biograph Theater in Chicago, a score of Department of Justice agents stake out the neighborhood. Melvin Purvis, chief investigator and an aide, sit in their car a few doors from the theater. More than an hour passes uneventfully 
And then, just before nine o'clock. Hey, Ed, there he is. Where? Walking up to the ticket office. I can't mistake that ahead. Oh, yeah, I see. And now he's turning. It's him, all right. And look, Mel, he's dyed his hair. Yeah, it's black. He's wearing gold-rimmed glasses. But that's him. You gonna let him get into the theater? Sure, we won't take any chances. Now he's bought his ticket and he's gone in. Keep trying on the exit, Ed. I'm gonna give the boys their final orders. Okay, Chief. That no, was him, Charlie. Yeah, I thought so. Now, uh, you and Mike stick around the doorway of the tavern here and keep your eye glued on that theater. Russell. Yes, Chief? You and Kelly watch those exits down the alley. Right. You'll probably be in there a couple of hours, but you might get suspicious and try to get out the back door. Yes, sir. And get this straight. No matter what he does, we're taking him tonight. Try to get him alive, but if you can't, get him dead. Two torturous hours are spent by the officers surrounding the theater. Two hours and four minutes. And then the doors of the theater swing wide and the shirt-sleeved audience throngs out into the sweltering summer night. Dillinger saunters onto the sidewalk, accompanied, so some reports say, by a young woman clad in red. Purvis closes in behind him. As Dillinger crosses an alley, Purvis waves his hand. Five officers close in. Suspicious, Dillinger reaches for his pocket. John Dillinger died on the way to the hospital, and 72 hours later, the story of his career of crime was being broadcast on Calling All Cars. Another famous master criminal was the subject of Broadcast 36. Herb Wilson, the nitroglycerin parson, minister turned safe robber. Only once in his career did he fail to break a safe. That was one night in Detroit when the gang, after weeks of preparation, set about to crack the safe of the National Maccabees organization, which contained $13 million. One by one, the guards are overpowered and locked up in closets. One by one, the 13 burglar alarm boxes are put out of commission. Then, all precautions taken, Wilson unwraps his equipment, the gas tank is wheeled in, and donning an asbestos apron of his own invention, the nitroglycerin parson lights his torch and sets to work on the massive safe. Like a knife through cheese, the hissing blue flame of the torch cuts through the thick steel box. Deeper, deeper as the hours of the night wheel on. Closer, closer to a tremendous fortune. The members of the gang crouch around their leader, watching with eyes gleaming with avarice as the hooded figure of the master cracksman bends over his work. Finally, toward dawn, Wilson raises his hooded head. Only another quarter of an inch, boys. Well, hurry up, Herb. It's getting late. Yeah, just a matter of a few seconds, and then... Thirteen million dollars. Yes, sir. Hey. Hey. What the... Herb. Herb, what the hell's wrong? I don't know. Let me try that tank. Well, that's that, boys. We're out of gas. Out of gas? And a quarter of an inch away from thirteen million dollars. Yep, that's the way it stands. Well, what are we going to do, Herb? What can we do? You can't get gas any place at 3 a.m. on Sunday morning. Well, we could, we could use nitro on it. Yes, if we had any. Oh, that's right. We didn't bring any with us. Yeah, well, it won't do any good crying about it, boys. We'd better get out of here and get out fast. Come on! After stealing more than $15 million in three years, Herb Wilson finally made a little mistake. He left his fingerprint on an electric light bulb. He is now in San Quentin for life. The biggest Western crime story of 1934 was the kidnapping of William F. Gettle, Beverly Hills oil millionaire. 48 hours after Mr. Gettle was released, Calling All Cars dramatized his adventure and presented Mr. Gettle himself to the entire nation over a coast-to-coast -coast hookup of the Columbia Network. The most pitiful aspect of the Gettle case was the horrible tension under which Mrs. Gettle lived during the long days when her husband's fate was a question. In the sun-filled garden of the Gettle mansion, the four children of the kidnapped millionaire, Billy and Betty, the twins, and Bobby and Jimmy, play their childish games, ignorant of the terrible plight of their father. In a darkened room on the first floor, Mrs. Gettle receives Mr. Noon, the attorney who is negotiating with the kidnappers. Mr. Noon. Is there any news? Yes, Mrs. Gettle, I have just received a call from the man who calls himself Percy. 
that is the way the ransom note I received last night said the message would be delivered. What did he say? He said to hold myself in readiness for further instructions. Do you think Will is all right? I have every confidence he will be back soon. Oh, I hope so. Mama, Mama, I want my daddy. Where's daddy? Now, children, run out and play. But where's daddy, Mama? Your daddy's gone away for a few days on business. When will he be back, Mama? He should be back any day now. But two days later, due to the keen ears of Detective Burris staked out on a dictaphone, the kidnappers are located and Mr. Gettle is released. 24 hours later, they are sentenced to life imprisonment in San Quentin. And 24 hours after that, while they are speeding northward to prison, calling all cars brought the biggest radio scoop of the year to the ears of the nation. Another famous criminal case of 1934 was the Nellie Madison murder case. Mrs. Madison, accused of murdering her husband, is faced with an overwhelming array of circumstantial evidence. Her attorney, in summing up his plea to the jury, was played by Richard Legrand in one of the most moving character depictions of the year. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you ever lost suddenly and horribly someone you held most dear? Have you ever been so stunned by personal misfortune that you were cold and indifferent to all that transpired about you? If you have, then you know what has been happening to Nellie Madison throughout this trial. There can be no murder without motive. And what possible motive could this woman have? The Madisons were a loving couple. You are being asked by the prosecution not only to hang a woman, but by all we've shown during this trial to hang an innocent woman. Don't do this thing. Don't have it on your souls and consciences the rest of your lives. Don't send this innocent woman to the gallows upon the tenuous threads of circumstantial evidence. Remember the command of our Almighty Father. Thou shalt not kill. <laughs> Well, fill her up with Rio Grande cracked. Well, I wouldn't dare give a police car any other gasoline. I don't think you could. I've just been listening to Rio Grande's Calling All Cars program. Did you hear it? Well, we got a Calling All Cars man right here with us tonight. Oh, well, I, I suppose you two cops will be the heroes on the next broadcast. Hey, how about putting you on the radio, too? <laughs> what have you got to say in behalf of the independent dealers who sell Rio Grande gasoline? Well, you, you tell your listeners that we independent dealers get a big kick out of so many people driving in after every broadcast and asking for a tank full of police car performance. Well, how about a business prediction for 1935? Everyone else is predicting. What do you think about business for next year? I can predict uh, good business for every independent gasoline dealer who lines up with Rio Grande. That's the only big gasoline company that doesn't compete with its own dealers. My business has grown steadily ever since I put in Rio Grande pumps. And my customers stick with me. They should. I give them better value in Rio Grande cracked gasoline, more power, faster starting, greater speed, higher anti-knock rating, and tetra ethyl at the price of ordinary gasoline. Well, come on, fellas. We got to go. Happy New Year. I'll go on one better. Rio Grande wishes you a prosperous New Year. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, cancellation broadcast 58. And congratulations on the good work, boy. Keep it up. Rolls and quiz. Calling All Cars is written and produced by William N. Robeson. The orchestra is under the direction of Frederick Stark. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night and a prosperous new year for the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling All Cars, a presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling All Cars, attention All Cars. 
Attention all Marin County Sheriff's cars. Broadcast 61. Four convicts just escaped from San Quentin Prison. Using a state car. License Diamond E 6154. Diamond E 6154. The convicts are reported headed north. All cars use discretion and hold fire if possible. As the escaped convicts have kidnapped four members of the prison board and are carrying them as hostages. Stand by for further orders. On tonight's program, you will hear speeding automobiles, roaring engines, the shriek of sirens as police cars tear over the roads on the trail of fleeing convicts. Police cars must always be ready for such emergencies. They must leap into action the second they get a warning over the police radio. That's why so many use Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Police officials in leading cities of the Southwest testify that the unusual speed and power created by Rio Grande's distinctive cracking process enables them to get the performance they demand. The men at the wheels of police cars are picked men, and police pick their gasoline just as carefully. That's why, after testing and comparing leading brands, more police cars and emergency equipment in California and Arizona are powered with Rio Grande cracked than with any other gasoline. There's a Rio Grande station near you, offering exactly the same gasoline police cars specify. Fill your tank. Thrill to the feel of police car performance in your own car. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that we bring you the complete radio dramatization of the San Quentin prison break, which occurred last Wednesday. This afternoon in San Francisco, Clyde Stevens, confessed bank robber and accomplice in the prison break, pled guilty to three counts of robbery with a gun and was sentenced to a term of from seven years to life on each count. It is believed that as we go on the air with the dramatization of his story, he is already en route to Folsom Prison. It is with pride that we remind you that Calling All Cars has brought you the story of Burma White as she was leaving for Tehachapi Prison. The May West Jewel Robbery, the day one of the robbers was apprehended in Miami, Florida. The story of the crime career of John Dillinger, 72 hours after his execution in Chicago. And the Gettle kidnapping case, 48 hours after Mr. Gettle's release. But it is with greater pride that we remind you that William N. Robeson, author and producer of Calling All Cars, dramatized the San Quentin prison break over the Columbia Don Lee Network a half hour after the capture of the escaped convicts, scooping every newspaper in the world. Four hours later, Mr. Robeson wrote and produced another last-minute radio station of the week's biggest story to the entire nation over the Columbia Coast to Coast Network. This, we believe, marks a milestone in radio broadcasting. And the Rio Grande Oil Company wishes publicly to thank the writer and producer of Calling All Cars, Bill Robeson, who consistently, for over a year, has served the radio public of the West, police news, while it was still sizzling hot. We now take you to San Francisco, where you will hear from the man who led the posse which captured the escaped San Quentin convict at Valley Ford. It is our great pleasure to present from the studios of KFRC in San Francisco, District Attorney Albert Bagshaw of Moran County. Good evening. Last Wednesday afternoon, I spent the most exciting two hours of my life. I've hardly returned to normal yet. I had gone to Tamales with Under Sheriff Blum to prosecute a petty case. We were following the routine of our duties when a telephone call from San Rafael plunged us into a melodrama as wild and exciting as any Nick Carter story you have ever read. That is the story you're about to hear on tonight's Calling All Cars. Before we go into this dramatization, which I know you are all eager to hear, I would like to point out to you a very serious condition which has existed for some time and which the prison break of last week has brought into the spotlight of public notice. I refer to the overcrowded condition of California prisons. 
built to accommodate 3,294 inmates, the San Quentin prison is now jam-packed with over 5,747 convicts. The result is a, a seething unrest among the prisoners. The rise in crime during the past years has been responsible for this overcrowding. Critics have pointed out that our parole system is lax. This may be so, but the brutal fact is that the parole board has to release many prisoners in order to make room for those coming up from the courts. So long as paroles are easy to obtain, crime will flourish. Our police forces in California do a splendid job, but the prison situation which causes the evil causes them to repeat over and over again the same work. Recidivists, habitual criminals, should be put away for good. But we in California, unfortunately, have no place to put them. We must have another prison. When we can adequately care for the criminal for as long as he is sentenced, we will show less desire to repeat, he will show less desire to repeat his acts. As it is now, men like Clyde Stevens do not wait a week after the release to start robbing banks again. This must be stopped. We have efficient police, they do their duty, and having done it, are forced to do it all over again. It is not only our faulty parole system which is to blame, but it is also our faulty prison system. Uh, May last Wednesday's deplorable incident served to arouse the people of California to demand the proper check against the rising tide of crime. Thank you and good night. Can't you listen to reason? You've got my watch, my money, my car. What else do you want? You ain't got enough dough on you. I can't help that. I've given you everything. Won't you let me out? Sure. That's not a bad idea. Sure we'll let you out, eh, Eddie? Sure thing. And there's a little souvenir to remember us by. Ooh. Open the door, oh, Eddie. Red oh, light. Don't throw me out. Slow down, please. What for? We're in a hurry. Go on, scram guy. There. Gee, I never knew a guy would bounce like that when he hit the road. Such was the crime that in 1931 sent Joe Christie, graduate of six prison terms in the Middle West, to San Quentin Penitentiary for from one to 25 years. Order. The attorney for the defense has the floor. Your Honor, my client has decided to make a confession and save the court valuable time. Very well. Will the defendant take the stand? Well, you see, Judge, it was this way. I pulled these jobs, but I wasn't alone. The coppers think they ain't got nothing on Lillian. But she's hot, Judge. She spotted the joints for me. Guess we must have knocked over 25 stores. Lillian's just as guilty as I am. If you send me up, you ought to send her up, too. And you call yourself a man. You get this girl into trouble like this, and then you try to save your skin by turning state's evidence against her. Well, it isn't going to help. You'll serve time, all right. There is no place in society for a skunk and a rat like you. With the stigma of skunk and rat attached to him, Alexander McKay entered San Quentin in the summer of 1931 to serve from five years to life for robbery. You mugs. Back up against that soda fountain and don't pull any funny stuff. Clean that cash register, Ben. Okay. Where are you going, sailor? No, I was just turning around. Well, stay put. I said stay put. No, you plugged him, Fred. I meant to. Come on, scram. For robbery, grand larceny, and assault with intent to commit murder, Fred Landers was sent to San Quentin three years ago to serve two terms of from five years to life. Look here, Street. We're wasting a lot of time. I know you held up that bank on College Avenue. And whether you want to confess or not, I'm going to send you up. Uh, you can't keep me in the big house. Well, that won't be my job. But I'm going to send you up there. So you might as well make my job easier by confessing. What will you do for me? You can't make a deal with me. You rob that bank and you'll do time. Okay, I pulled that job. But I'll make a little bet. 
But I'll be out of stir before they make you chief for getting this confession. Rudolph Strait, confessed bank robber and veteran jailbird, tried twice to make good his boast. Once he sawed through the bars of his cell. Another time he was caught working the bolts of his cell door with a bent wrench. He was thrown into solitary. Returned once more to his cell, he strikes up an acquaintance with Clyde Stevens, another bank robber in the prison yard. Yeah, you look like a tough guy to me, Strait. I am. You want to get out of this joint, huh? Don't you? Sure. I'm getting out, too. How come? I got dragged. The parole board will hand me my walking papers next time it meets. Yeah? Sure. They gave me a five-to-life rap. And you're getting out after three years? Sure. Parole's a cinch in this state. Well, I ain't going to wait for no parole. That's the way I figured you. And I got a plan. Yeah, what is it? As soon as I get out, I'll fix it so I can get some gats into you. You will? That's all I need. Give me a good gat and I'll walk right out of here. Okay. I'll get you the gats. You get a couple more guys you can depend on. Yeah. We join up as soon as you make the break. By that time, I'll have some joints cased. Why, son, we'll make that Dillinger mob look sick. It's okay with me. All right. I'll stop this monkeying around with files and bent wrenches. Stay out of solitary and you'll be at the business end of a 45 in no time. On October 31st last year, Stevens was paroled. And within two months, he is wanted by San Francisco authorities for bank robbery. Although the police are unable to find the man, he manages to keep in contact with his prison pal, Rudolph Street. One day a fortnight ago in the prison carpenter's shop. Hey, Alec. Yeah? There's that prison truck again. Yeah, what about it? That's a truck that goes in and out of the walls. Stephen hid the gats in it. They're under the dash. They've been there for two weeks and I ain't had a chance to get them out. Is that driver's liable to find them. That's what I'm afraid of. Now listen. Watch that guy. And if you got a chance, glum those rods and hide him somewhere. Yeah, where? Now, that cake of nails will be okay. Look, there goes the driver now. He's walking toward the office. I'll keep my eyes on him and you grab those gats. Okay. Get him okay? Sure, I got him. All right, stash him in that keg. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. Now we'll roll this keg behind this workbench where nobody can see it. Hey, is it just you and Joe Christie and me in this deal, ain't it? That's right. Well, Steve said us four gats. Yeah? Well, in that case, we better make it a quartet. Hey, who do you want to cut in? Uh, how about Landers over there? Yeah, he's okay. He can take it. I'll talk to him. Hey, Fred. Come here. What do you want? Act like you was giving me a hand. I want to ask you something. What is it? Look here, Landers. Got a 45 in your hands. You take out the lamb out of this joint? What are you doing? Trying to kid me? No, we're on the level. Hey, you bird. Separate. Get back to work. What do you think this is? A tea party? I'll tell you about it later, Fred. Beat it. Early last Wednesday morning, the inmates of the prison file into the washroom. Straight signals to Christie, Landers, and McKay. Cautiously, they move over toward him and engage in guarded conversation. Come on, get your face dry and get over there. What's up, Rudy? I asked you the other day if you'd be willing to blaze out of here with a forty-five. Yeah. Well, today's the day. I thought you was fooling. I'm on the level. How about you, boys? I'm all set. Any time you are, Rudy. What makes you set on today? Yeah, the prison board's meeting with the warden this morning. None of these flat-footed guards want any trouble while the big shots are here. Maybe they'll get some whether they want it or not, eh, you know, Rudy? You know, the way we get so close to it, I, I've been kind of thinking, see? Uh, suppose it don't work. Suppose we get plugged or something. Ain't yellow, are you, McKay? Of course I ain't yellow. You better not be. You're in this too deep now to back out. I want to back out. I was just thinking Stop of it. it. This ain't no chin fest. We gotta work fast. What do we do for gas? It's all taken care of. I ain't got nothing to do but come along and do what you're told. We got some 45 stashed away. That's well. <laughs> Who's that? Oh, one of the cons. Fresh fish, I think. I don't know him. You think you heard anything? No, he wouldn't be making a noise if he was spying on us. You can never tell about stools. Now, look, the board's meeting in the warden's office, eh? Yeah, so what? I've been tipped off that they'll go over to the warden's house for lunch, eh? No. What's that got to do with us? If I knew how dumb you were, I wouldn't have cut you in. Now, get this. We drive up in the old Ford like we were doing our work. But all the time, we got the 45s in our belts, eh? Yeah, then what? So we go in and we snatch the warden and the prison board. What? You're nuts. No, I ain't. We snatch the warden and the prison board. They'll come in handy. Cops won't shoot so fast when they know we've got big shots in tow. Oh, the warden and the prison board. They've been handing out and turning down paroles all morning. I'd like to see how it feels to be the guy on the carpet. And for once, we'll be the big shots. <laughs> kind of a funny idea, don't you think? It's okay if it works, Rudy. Listen to me, you guys. You stick with me and do this job the way I planned it, and we'll all be out of this joint in less than four hours. A few minutes before noon... 
Joseph Stevens, Frank Sykes, Warren Atherton, Charles Cox, and Mark Noon, members of the State Prison Board, take a recess from their morning meeting and join Warden Hollihan at luncheon at his home within the prison walls. The pleasant sun-filled room gives no indication of the impending danger that lies just outside those curtained French windows, where eight hard eyes are watching every movement, eight keen ears hearing every word. Well, Warden, you're to be congratulated on the splendid work you're doing, especially in view of your limitations here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sykes. I can assure you that no one knows better than I the necessity for a even congestion here in prison. We have almost twice as many prisoners as the institution was built for, and the result is unrest among the men. But it can't be helped. I presume you feel as though you were living on the edge of a volcano all the time. <laughs> well, something like that. You see, gentlemen, the granting of early paroles is by no means the answer to our problem. You're quite right, Warren. The only answer is the erection of another prison. Uh, pardon me, but there seems to be somebody at the door. Take him out, Dan. Hey, what's the meaning of we this? We mean business, Warden. Up with him. Uh, look here. You can't come in here like this. Oh, yeah. I've been wanting to do this for a long time, Warden. Oh! oh. All right, Rudy. Cut it out. Oh. Cut out the rough stuff. I don't like that guy. Okay, snap out of it. We didn't come here to bump the Warden off. Just what did you come here for? We're going to get out of this place and we're going to take you with us. What for? <laughs> You'll make good bulletproof vests. Uh, don't you realize there's a law against kidnapping in California? You can be executed for this. Yeah, well, we're the law. And if there's any executing to be done, we'll do it. Now, look here. If you boys are on the square and promise there won't be any shooting, I'll go with you as hostage. But please remember, I'm the father of four children. I guess we'd better take all of you. Then we'll be sure. Now, you guys take off your clothes. Why? We're going to need them. Come on, let's have your coats and vests. You can wear our uniforms. My but listen. Come on, park over. Well, except you, you're too fat. None of us can wear your coat. Yeah, that's a consolation. But you can do something else for us. You call the prison gate and tell them to send the warden's car over and... That we're coming through the gate and have it open. Well, but let's... Go on, there's the phone. Uh, well, all right. Let me have the west gate, please. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Uh, th this is Mark Noon speaking. Well, send the warden's call over to the house, please. Yes, yes, that's right. Tell him you're all coming through. Uh, the whole board will be coming out in a minute. So have the gate open, please. That's right. <laughs> and you birds look like a swell of something of cons. And we look just about as respectable as you did when you had these clothes on, I guess. Come on, Rudy, let's get going. Don't get excited, Joe. Okay, gentlemen, here's the car. Out through the side door here. Oh, what about the warden? I would have to leave him. He'll come to sooner or later. Alec, you talk to those guards. All right, gentlemen, make it snappy. Got those rifles. Why, what the devil? Help him away, shoot these men. Okay, gentlemen, file in the back. You there, stay at the wheel. You're driving us. This other guard, you stand on the running board. Come on, boys, make it snappy. Look here, man. You'll never get away with this. Get in! This is my party. That's fine. Okay, boys, let's go. Kick that siren open and drive straight to the west gate. <laughs> Closed in on the territory surrounding San Quentin Penitentiary. Posses are hastily organized. The bombing squadron at Hamilton Field stands by for orders that will send them searching from the air. The safe teletype spins the law's web across California, describing the escaped convicts, describing their fleeing car. A few miles out of San Rafael, the convict car turns right, heading for the Black Point cutoff. As they come inside of the cutoff, the drawbridge swings open with exasperating slowness. They pull up with a burning screech of brakes. Can you imagine? We're perfectly out of that heat when that monkey has to start pulling switches. What's the do? We go back, Rudy. You're telling me. Now 
we got to go back into all the cops in the world. Gee, if you don't mind, shut up. Well, I want to ask a question. Let him talk. It'll make him feel good. Ain't you never heard of an emotional catharsis? What's that? Some kind of snow? What's in your mind, Toots? Uh, what I want to know is, how in the world did you get those guns? <laughs> That's a professional secret. And what you don't know won't hurt you. Rudy, look. What? Cops ahead. Get your gas out. Step in that siren, Mark, and drive like hell. <laughs> I figured. They're afraid to shoot on account of our passengers. You boys are a great help to us. Now, look here, driver. Uh, what's your name, by the way? Jones. Oh, one of the Jones boys, huh? Well, listen, Jonesy, just pull up a minute. I'm going to let your fat friend out here. What? Yeah, you're going to get out, and you're going to tell that posse back there to call out the dogs, or we'll bump off your pals here. Give us a half hour, and everything will be okay. Pull up, Jonesy. Get out, and don't forget that message. Get going, Jonesy. <laughs> Mark Noon, secretary of the prison board, immediately phones the prison of his whereabouts. With orders to hold fire as long as possible, the army of the law goes into action. From San Francisco, from Oakland, from Berkeley, come officers. Quickly, the peace forces are organized. And with police radio blaring last-minute flashes, a posse composed of hundreds of men in scores of police cars block every highway and byway in Petaluma and Moran counties. The posse closes in, combing the hilly north coast country. As the convict's car swoops into Hicks Valley's road, the posse sights them. The chase is on! Deputy sheriffs pull down their shotguns from the roofs of their high-powered police cars. State patrolmen crouch over their white motorcycles, unlimber their guns, fire and scream. Ten miles, twelve miles, fourteen miles, they roll west of Petaluma. The law holds its guns in readiness. The convicts, still out of range, apprehensively look backward. Then, when they are eighteen miles away from Petaluma, the convict's car takes a turn too sharply. The car skids. The law is within range. Road, you guys. Hey, Jonesy, keep the car on the road. Can't help it. They shot off the rear tire. What's the matter with you? Oh, they got me in the leg. Uh, try to pick off that guy in the motorcycle, Joe. Come on, Jonesy, more speed. I can't. They're stuck. with the rear tire off. Well, I can. Don't throw me up. Or... Oh, Pick him out, Alex. I'll drive the damn thing. No use, Rudy. They're gaining on us. Uh, I can't get any more speed out of this thing than he is. There's some buildings up ahead. Let's fight it out there. Okay, I'll slow down. You guys jump. Frank? I think so. I tell you, you no. For the love of God, Sheriff, that's Atherton. They made us change our clothes. Where are the men? Ran into that building. Okay, men, surround the building. We got a back choice behind you. Hey, got him. Let him have it, boys. Hold your fire. We surrender. Then throw your guns out and come out with your hands in the air. Take them down and slap the handcuffs on them, Sheriff. Yep. And, boys? Have you had a pleasant trip? What you do? Murder Rudy? No, I got him before he got me. And now, unless there are any objections, suppose we return to San Quentin. There are some questions I'd like to ask you. Some very pertinent questions. Rudolph Strait, the convict leader, dies on the way to the hospital. James Stevens and Frank Sykes, not dangerously wounded, are taken to the Petaluma Hospital. And Warden Hollihan lies in the prison hospital, critically injured as District Attorney Albert E. Bagshaw of Marin County begins his investigation of the prison break. Boys, I'm not going to mince any words with you. Two California laws threaten all of you with death penalty. One says the kidnapping is a capital crime. The other says that any lifetimer involved in a prison disturbance in which bodily injury occurs is liable to be executed. The latter applies to at least two of you. Now we know this is an outside job. You haven't a chance to beat the rat. I want to know where those guns come from. Five Stevens sent them into us. Shut up, you rat. I never expected you'd spill, McKay. You haven't changed any since you took that girl to prison with you, have you? Five Stevens, eh? Know him, Captain? Sure, I know him. He was paroled about three months ago, and we're looking for him for bank robbery. We had a trap set for him day before yesterday, and he knocked over a bank right under our noses. I got a line on his hideaway, and I was going up there this afternoon to knock him over when well... this happened. You've got a double reason for a visit now. I should say I have. And I'll have that boy in the can before midnight. I promise you that. I wouldn't be too sure about that, you big flatfoot. That guy's a killer. It is close to midnight. San Francisco Bay is shrouded in deep fog. 
Captain DeLay, at the head of a posse of 15 men, crosses the narrow strip of water between the mainland and Sherman Island in the delta of the Sacramento River. Cruising at half speed, the motorboat scarcely makes a sound. Quietly, they shunt into a little pier, scramble on the land. That's his shack. Lights are still on. Take it easy. Surround the place, boys. And have your guns ready. All set? Set. Let's go, then. Pick him up, Stevens. Hey, what the devil? Hey, what's this all about? Pick him up, I said. And your pal, too. What do you want us for? Running guns into San Quentin and a couple of bank robberies. I don't know nothing about running guns or bank robberies, either. Oh? Huh? Well, we'll talk about that later. Slap the bracelets on him, Tom. The officers return across the black waters of East Bay with their two captives, Clyde Stevens and Albert Kessel. They leave their boat at Antioch and walk through the deserted streets of the little town to their waiting police cars. Suddenly... Look out, boys! Stevens got away! Oh! Stop her on fire! Uh, that patrol... Get the corner. I'm gonna fix that guy. What's the big idea, Mug? You dicks are gonna take me in. You can bump me off first. Well, I don't think that'll be necessary. But if you don't come quietly, why... I guess we'll have to take you in this way. Come on, boys. For three days, San Francisco police questioned Clyde Stevens, and finally on Saturday he confessed and explained how he had smuggled the guns into San Quentin, hidden in the prison truck. He was sentenced to from seven years to life in Folsom Prison this afternoon. District Attorney Bagshaw is now preparing the prosecution which may possibly send Christy, McKay, and Landers to the gallows. And high state officials are studying a wide, sweeping prison reform, which will include revision of the present parole system, separation of habitual criminals from first offenders, creation of a unified state police system, and possibly the erection of another state penitentiary in Southern California. Speeding police cars played an important part in this sensational capture. Nearly every day, you hear police sirens and watch police cars roar past. Cars that are powered with Rio Grande crack. And it is from this gasoline that they get their tremendous power and speed. Police use Rio Grande because it saves precious seconds. Seconds when human life is often at stake. Police know that Rio Grande crack is the fastest starting gasoline, the speediest and the most powerful. But they also know because they keep accurate records that Rio Grande is economical gasoline to buy. Your own car may meet emergencies any second. When you tramp hard on the gas, you want action. If you've got Rio Grande in your tank, you'll get action. You can enjoy police car performance in your own car. Just drive into the independent station near you with a big Rio Grande sign. Ask for Rio Grande crack with tetraethyl. It costs you no more than other gasolines, but you get much more for your money. And if you're interested in true detective stories, ask for your free copy of Calling All Cars News. This unique new publication brings you the truth about crime, police, movies, and the radio. Ask any Rio Grande dealer for a copy. It's absolutely free. Calling all cars, ascension all cars, cancellation broadcast 61, regarding a prison break at San Quentin. Convicts are now returned to prison, that's all. Calling all cars is written and produced by William N. Robeson. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, saying good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. Copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Phoenix Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 166. Be on the lookout for a gang of safe floors known to be operating in this district. Pick up any suspicious characters seen lording near large stores. That's all. Field, you have taken the part of a police officer in a great many of these broadcasts and have heard me tell time after time about our sponsor's products. 
What stands out most prominently in your mind about Rio Grande cracked gasoline? Rio Grande cracked gasoline powers more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment than any other brand. That is to say, in the Rio Grande territory. Yes. Mr. McNear, you've got a detective's memory for details. Do you recall some of the cities that have used Rio Grande cracked gasoline? Well, Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, Fresno, Santa Barbara, San Diego. And last week you mentioned three new ones. Pasadena, Phoenix, and another town up north. One of Mark Twain's towns. Uh, Marysville, is that right? That's right. And the counties? Oh, yes. Uh, Maricopa County, Arizona. Good. We mustn't forget Maricopa County, Arizona. Its sheriff's cars serve a third of the total population of Arizona. And then there's Santa Barbara County, Orange County, San Diego County, and many, many others. Mr. Lewis? Well, Rio Grande cracked gasoline gives police car performance in any car. Right. There's one more thing you gentlemen might have mentioned. The patented Sinclair cracking process. Rio Grande cracked gasoline is the only gasoline you can buy that is refined by this famous process. It breaks up gasoline to finer atoms. Makes it burn more readily, more completely. The Sinclair cracking process is the reason for police car performance. It is the reason for Rio Grande's popularity among city and county officials. To our listeners in, let me suggest you try Rio Grande cracked gasoline. See your nearest independent Rio Grande dealer tomorrow. Tonight we take pleasure in presenting Captain John J. McGrath, Chief of Detectives of the Phoenix Police Department. Captain McGrath. Good evening. Tonight's dramatization of calling all cars is a very good illustration of the reasons why three time loser law was put into effect. It used to be that a criminal could go out and commit a crime and if was caught, serve the sentence prescribed by law, therefore walk out of prison to resume his criminal activities at will. And knowing this, they figured that crime as a career was a good living, even their short interruptions of six months or a year in jail. But three-time loser law puts away a different perspective of the situation. When a man has caught a convicted and the judge learns that it is his third offense, that man goes to Folsom and he goes for life. He knows when he goes that he has no chance of a parole. If this law has been in effect when the chief criminal in tonight's story became his operation, a great deal of time, and when he would have been saved. Wanted for burglary by Bakersfield, Sutter County, Shasta County, San Joaquin County, and Utah Police. Committed and released from state penitentiaries in Omaha and Milwaukee, from Folsom and McNeil's Island for robbery and receiving stolen property. Return to McNeil's Island in 1920 for post office robberies at Anderson and Ripon, California. Released in 1923 and three months later sent to the Utah State Penitentiary for receiving stolen property. Such is the record of 31-year-old one-eyed John Sagatti. When in the spring of 1927 he dropped off a freight train to find himself in Glendale, Arizona. Badly in need of some food after the long, cold boxcar journey, his first stop is a small, greasy spoon restaurant. Ham and eggs, a pair. Straight up on the eggs, carry the ham to a warm kitchen. Yes, sir, what'll it be? Cup of coffee to start with. One cup of jabber. Coming up. Hey, Eddie, help our little service over here. Be right with you. Here you are, mister. Thanks. You figured out what you want to eat yet? Yeah, give me a waffle and a couple of strips of bacon on the way. Two strips of bacon with a waffle under them. Make that bacon crisp, will you? Burn the pig! Is that all you want? Yeah. Okay. Hello, fella. When did you come in? Uh, just now, with the chances of a little food. Sure. What'll it be? Same old thing? No, not tonight. I think I'll have a little of your lamb stew for a change and coffee. Okay. Cook's revenge on the dinner. Okay, George. Sorry to keep you waiting. What can I do for you? Uh, mind if I look at some of that paper then? Huh? Oh, sure. Here. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Uh, 
Yes, sir. We're making it hot for the bootleggers around here. There's a couple of fellas got a year apiece today. Well, for bootlegging? Yeah. Boy, can you imagine spending a year in jail for something like that? <laughs> Anybody that's dumb enough to turn to bootlegging ought to be sent up. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, there's no big dough in that racket. Oh, I don't know about that. Seems to me there's plenty. No real dough. Well, I don't know what you call real dough, but I'd like to have what some of the big ones have made this last couple of years. Uh, I can make more than those guys ever saw in six months. How you doing? And I don't have to peddle liquor to do it. Huh? How? Oh. That's my business. Oh, oh sure. <laughs> I didn't mean to get personal. Uh, that's all right. Just forget it. Here you are. Waffle and bacon with a bacon crisp. How's my stew coming? Oh, yeah. I'll look into that. I'll have it here in a second. Hey, what does the guy do around here for excitement? Oh, a little of everything. Mostly play pool down at the pool hall. Pool, huh? <laughs> yeah, I haven't shot any pool for a long time. Oh, I'm going down there tonight as soon as I finish eating. Why don't you drop in for a game? Oh, that is if you, if you want to. Yeah, I might do it at that. Yeah, if you want to, you can go down with me. I'll, I'll be through here about the same time you are. Okay. Sounds swell. I don't know nobody here in town. Just got in. <laughs> I kind of go for a good game of rotation. Oh, fine, good enough. As soon as we get through, we'll go over there. Ah, oh, here you are. Cook's Revenge, right out of the family stew bowl. Cook to perfection and uh, a whole lot of things I can't think of right now. And a short time later, John Zagotti and his newfound companion, whose name he learns is Stanley Borofsky walk into a small pool hall, engage in a round of rotation. During the game, Sagotti seizes every opportunity to strengthen his friendship for Borowski. And at the end of the third game, when Borowski suggests it is time for him to go home, Sagotti suggests they have a drink together first. And a short time later, the two men stand before the bar of a tiny speakeasy. Well, here's how. Yeah, right. <coughs> Well, not bad <laughs> for what it is. Yeah, it's the best place in town. Hey, you lived here in Glendale long? Yeah, just long enough to know the town fairly well. You work somewhere? Uh, <laughs> no. At the moment, I'm what you might call out of a job. Oh, well, that makes two of us. I'm in the same boat. Oh, yeah? What's your business? My business? Yeah. What do you do when you're working? Well, <laughs> I guess you might call me an explosives expert. That is, if you have to call me anything. <laughs> An explosives expert. Yeah. I guess I don't follow you. You mean you go around blowing things up? Look, suppose we just skip the whole thing. You know, let it drop. <laughs> You're a funny sort of fellow. First you make a crack about money over the restaurant tonight, and then when I ask you what you mean, you, you freeze up. Now you do the same thing all over again. You still remember that remark about dough I made, huh? Sure, I do. As a matter of fact, I'd like to know what you meant by it. <laughs> I'm sort of curious that way. Oh. Uh -huh. Well, uh, maybe if you told me your business, we could talk better, Mr. Borowski, eh? Mm, well, no, no. Yeah, you see? You want me to spill all about myself. But with you, it's different. No, 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 not exactly. But no, only... you uh, don't want to talk in this place, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Well? See, look, I got a room up a little hotel. How would it be if we went over there? Well, it's Jake with me. Ah, oh, good, I... I don't know just why, but I got a feeling that bumping into each other the way we did was a piece of luck. Check. I got the same idea. Yeah, come on, man. Let's go out of here and go where we can talk without people. And a few minutes later in his hotel room, Stanley Borowski, 29-year-old Russian, listens with growing amazement as Sagotti unfolds his ideas on how to make big money... Without having to sell liquor. It's as simple as that. All you got to do is be careful and take your time planning the job. Then when you're all set, walk in and crack it. Yeah, but isn't cracking a safe a pretty hard thing to do? Nah. I tell you, I can blow the door off one of them and it won't even bust anything. Just open the door and that's all. Yeah, sounds easy, but I don't know. Never heard of anything like it before. Yeah, that's because you're green. I'm telling you, there's no one in the country that knows more about soup and how to use it than me, Johnny Sagatti. You know, it's funny how I just figured you out tonight. All of a sudden, uh, I knew we were going to get together. It was, well, uh, just like that. Yeah? Only we're not together yet. How do I know you'll go through with a job with me, huh? I don't know anything about you. Ah, listen, don't worry about me. I won't let you down. I'm not quite as green as you think. You ever been in jail? No. Well, that helps. 
No busybody coppers liable to spot you, then. Uh, sure, and I'm willing to take orders, too. Uh, Up to yeah. a point. I don't know why, but I think you're all right. Suppose we get some sleep, and tomorrow we'll talk some more about it, eh? I got an idea that maybe you and me can make a nice bit of dough. But first, I gotta be sure. About you, I mean. And apparently, Borowski convinces Sagotti of his sincerity. For a month later in a small shack on the outskirts of Phoenix, Arizona. Now, here's the gag. I've got a joint spotted that looks right. But we got a little bit of casing to do on it before we crack it. Okay. Where is it? On the corner of 10th and McDowell. That pay and take it store. They do a good business. As I'm plenty wrong, there's a nice wad in that safe all the time. Yeah, but how are we going to get in? Well, I got that all figured. It's a cinch. The only thing we've got to watch out for are those merchant patrol guys. That's the first thing you got to do. Hang around until you find out how many of them there are and when they make their rounds. And how do I do that? By using your eyes. Nobody's going to notice you if you're careful. And if they do, what do you think I got those deputy sheriff's badges for, huh? All you got to do is flash your buzzer and say you're looking for someone. Uh, okay, I'll go over to town first thing in the morning. That's the idea. While you're doing that, I'm going to see where I can get a little nitro and some fuse. That's all we need, the way I do things. Safe full of dough, little soup. My experience, and we'll be sitting pretty. Accordingly, every day for the following week, Borowski loiters near the pay-and-take-it keeps an accurate check on the merchant patrolman's routine visits while Sagotti secures the needed nitroglycerin and fuses. And at last, at 3 a.m., June 23rd, a large truck rolls to a stop in front of the store. Two men climb out, walk to the front door. You got the stuff with you? Yeah. Okay. Keep an eye out while I jimmy this door. It's all right. That's got it. Come on. Shut the door behind you. Yeah, okay. Safe's over here. You can get to it without any lights. That's well. Let's go. I still think it'd be a better idea to blow it in here. And uh, maybe you do, but I'm running things, and I say we take it out and put it on the truck like we planned. You said it was a small one, didn't you? Yeah, it is. All right, then we take it with us. Yeah, okay. Well, come on. What are you stalling for? Thought you said you knew where the thing was. Yeah, I do. One of the place looks different in the dark. It's it's hard to get your direction. Yeah, we'd better get to it quicker. Some nosy cop will be able to find that truck out there and decide to investigate. Oh, here it is. It's over here. Okay. Come on. Give me a hand. We'll carry it out of here. You mean we we just walk out with this thing? You hurt me. I said, give me a hand. Now stop gabbing and do what you're told. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Here we go. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Carry it out, they do. Right out the front door to the waiting truck. Then, with their prize loaded on the back, they drive out to an isolated spot on the banks of the Grand Canal. And there, Borowski gets his first instructions on safe blowing. Now, the first thing to do is to take this soap and seal the space around the door. Like this, eh? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you gotta do that to keep the charge in when it goes off. Yeah, sure, I get it. Then the next step is to pour the soup in through this hole I bored in the top. And that's the important part of the job. Mm -hmm. How come? Because if you don't get enough soup in, the thing doesn't come open. And if you get too much in, you blow the whole door off, and that makes too much noise. It's kind of tricky stuff, isn't it? Plenty. I've seen this stuff used wrong, blow a guy to pieces. You wouldn't like that. No, neither did the guy I saw. Now, uh, give me a piece of that fuel. Oh, okay. Oh, not all of it, just a short hunk. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, here's the last step before we bust her. You see here? Now, I stick this fuse in through the hole, like this, eh? Yeah, I see. Then you take some more of the soap and seal all around it. Well, I... you certainly know your business. I'll say that for you. Yeah, I ought to. I worked in the munitions factory long enough. Now, well, she's all set. All we do is light the fuse and... Boom. She's open. Yeah. If it works, don't worry. It'll work. Now, uh, stand back away from what? Are you sure it won't blow us up? Uh, I told you I know what I'm doing. Now, watch it. Uh, that's got it. Say, will you look at that? Why, it just opened the door as pretty as anything. Didn't even make a noise. Only amateurs make noise on a safe job. 
Come on, grab some of this dough and stuff it in that bag there. Yeah, how about the checks? You're going to take them? Nah, checks ain't no good. Trace you from a check. Leave them alone. Okay, okay. I got all the money there is in there. Yeah, then there's nothing stopping us. Come on, let's go. And early the following morning, back in town, a puzzled store manager stands before the place where his face should be. Puts two and two together and hurriedly calls the police. And responding to the call, two detectives arrive. Listen to his story. I tell you, Lieutenant, it's not possible. I saw that safe when I left here last night, and now this morning, it's, it's gone. Obviously. Did you notice anything else wrong before you found the safe missing? Nothing. How about the doors, windows? They've been tampered with? Well, I didn't open up myself. But if there had been anything like that, I'm sure the boy who did open would have told me. Mm-hmm. Where's that boy now? Why, uh, he's around here somewhere. Uh, yes, yes, that's him over there uh, by the cash register. I think we'd better have a talk with him, Ed. Uh, you don't think one of my own men had anything to do with this, do you? I wouldn't know. But it's a cinch that in order to carry that safe out of here, whoever did it will have to get in and out through something, a door or a window. And I can't figure anyone boosting a safe through a window, can you? Well, now that you put it that way, I, I can't. No. All right. Well, let's talk to that boy. Uh, Jim. Yes, sir? Uh, come over here a minute, will you? Yes, sir. What is it? Uh, Jim, these two gentlemen are detectives. Uh, they want to ask you a few things. Why, okay. It's all right with me. Jim, I understand you opened up this morning. Is that right? Yes, sir. Did you notice anything unusual about any of the doors? No, sir. That is... Nothing except the... Say, wait a minute. There was one thing. The front door seemed to be kind of loose on its hinges when I unlocked it. Loose on the hinges, eh? Yes, sir. Only <laughs> I didn't think much about it at the time. Come on, Ed. Let's take a look at that door. There's just a chance that we'll find some fingerprints. Then we'd better call the station and get a description of the safe in. Start the boys out looking for it. Right. So the Phoenix police start the job of locating one missing safe, hope to find some clue as to the identity of the burglars. And two hours after a description of the safe is phoned to headquarters, the phone in the burglary detail comes to life. Burglary detail, Wade speaking. Uh, Wade, this is Norris. I think we found your missing safe. Is that right? Where? Out here, the old schoolhouse. Good enough. It's one of the neatest jobs of safe running I've ever seen. It's all right, Norris. You stay there and we'll get out as fast as possible. Don't let anyone touch it. Might get some fingerprints. Okay, Virginia. Informed of the discovery, Chief of Detective John J. McGrath, accompanied by Wage and Detective Eddie Moore, rush to the canal bank, make a complete examination of the blown safe. But after a minute inspection, they find that there are no fingerprints. No clues of any sort that might help identify the criminals. The only thing they do agree upon is that this is the work of an expert. Accordingly, returning to headquarters, McGrath notifies all patrolmen to keep a sharp lookout for the suspicious characters. Gives orders to his men to round up all known petty racketeers in the city. Try to learn if any newcomers are in town. But after two weeks of extensive investigation, the police find themselves with nothing to go on. No lead at all to the criminals. It is 2.30 in the morning, July 20th, one month after the pay-and-take at robbery. In a small office located in the Sun Mercantile Company at 616 South 7th Avenue, two men converse in low tones. Listen to the high whine of an electric drill. How is it? All right. Be through in a second. You got the crack soaked? Yeah, all but the top where you're working. Okay. You know, I got to laugh when I think how we fooled the cops in this town. That crack in the papers last week about the pay and take a job. Haven't been done by a gang of East and safe blowers. <laughs> and about the police being convinced they'd left town. Yeah, we got him up a tree, all right. <sighs> there she goes. Now, take this drill and I'll load her. Yeah, okay. I got it. Careful of that water on the floor. Don't get the cord in it or we'll short the works. Oh, yeah, I see it. There you are. Okay. Now we pour in a little... Like this. Not too much. Just the right amount. And it's primed. You got the fuse? Oh, yeah, it's right here. Oh, oh, what's the matter? Oh, I dropped it in that puddle of water there. Well, that's swell. It's the only piece we've got with us. Well, I couldn't help it. It just dropped. All right, there's no use crying about it now. We'll just have to go and get some more. Well, that's taking an awful chance, isn't it? Sure, but what else can we do? You can't blow a safe without a fuse. Okay, don't get hot about it. I'm not getting hot. Come on, let's stop cabin and get back to Maud's. 
Sneaking out of the store, Zagotti and Borowski make a hurried trip back to their hideout, a small shack on the outskirts of town. There they secure more fuse and return to finish the uncompleted job. But as they enter the office again... Hey, will you look at that? I thought you said you soaked the cracks right. Why, I did. Well, then how come the soup's all run out? Look on the floor there. Oh, yeah, I see it. That means we'll have to load her all over again. More time lost. Well, come on, let's get started. Doesn't do it. Get us in where stand around here arguing. Uh, yeah, maybe you're right. Now, take some more soap and stuff it in the cracks. Make sure it's in tight. I'll soup her again. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now she's loaded. Now hand me that fusion. Don't drop it. Oh, yeah. Here it is. Now, pack some soap around it. That's it. Swell. Now we're all set. Yeah, clear. Listen, Mac. Stand back just in case it... I don't know. Must have loaded it too much. Blew the door clear through the skylight. We better get out of here. Yeah, grab all the dough you can and let's get a move on. That crash will bring every cop in town on the run inside of five minutes. I've got all I can stuff in my pocket. Okay, come on, let's go. Rushing out a side door on the Hadley Street, Zagotti and Borowski avoid the first arrivals by a scant matter of seconds. Down to the Santa Fe train yard they run, where they bury the money, as well as the deputy sheriff's badges and their guns. Then from there, they detour around the center of town and at last reach their hideout. Apparently, despite the slip-up, the job has turned out all right. But two days later, in Chief McGrath's office... Now, uh, listen, boys. This may be a wild goose chase, but it's worth it. I got a tip that there were a couple of men living out in that shack just outside the city limits. You know, Maud's place? Oh, yes, we know the place. Now, here's the idea. We go out there and we look the place over. If the men are there, we walk in and grab them. What do we grab them on? Suspicion of robbery. Of course, they may not have had anything to do with the jobs, but it's worth trying. Sounds good to me, Chief. Good. Now, when we get there, here's the routine. You go to the front door, Wage, and uh, more you go to the right side. Okay. Contiers to the left. We'll take charge of the back. They'll probably be in the kitchen. <laughs> you should have seen that safe door fly through the air, Marty. It was terrific. Nah, you <laughs> boys are going to get in trouble someday. You're too smart for your own good. <laughs> That's a hot one, eh, Johnny? Marty here's going to tell us how to do a job. Yeah. <laughs> well, the cops in this place don't even know we exist. Yeah. By this time, they'll be talking about Eastern gangsters and a lot of hooey like that. I tell you, we got things down, Pat. Sure. Until they put you away for a while. They ain't going to put this boy away for any while. Because I'd let him have it before I got to go with him. What do you think of that, huh? I think you're talking big. Yeah? How about you, Borowski? Would you let them pick you up without making a show, huh? Yeah, but I'll say I wouldn't. Well, all I can see is you boys think you're pretty hot. But I've seen hot ones before. I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, you guys are really... What's that? I don't know. What? All right. Oh, you so long. Uh... Stay where you are. Get your hands up. I will, like... Right, Johnny, you'll shoot both of us. Come on, boys. Priskies, too. What's the idea of butting in like that? We ain't done nothing. David, any talking you want to do can be done Yeah, but we ain't done nothing. You boys are sure pretty sloppy cracksmen. What do you mean, sloppy? Just what I said. Clumsy, sloppy. You don't know how to super safe, right? Oh, yeah? Well, Johnny, here's the best safe crack in the country. If it hadn't been for... shut up, you clumsy fool. Well, well, so we hurt the boy's feelings and he spills all over the place. Well, you can't pin anything on me for that. Maybe not. But I have an idea your pal here will talk more after he's away from you. How about it? Oh, I, I don't know anything about it. About what? Oh, about those jobs. Uh, about anything. Uh-huh. I can see that. Come on, get moving. We'll make you talk more about this at the station. And after interrogating Borowski for less than an hour, Chief McGrath has him sent back to the jail. Brings in Sagotti. Sullenly, the man eyes him. Then... Well? Well, what, Sigurdy? How do you know my name? And your friend Borowski told me. That and a lot more. What do you mean by that crack? Simply that I know all about you two. You mean to tell me that that guy squealed on me? I didn't say that, only he talked. Why, that lousy stool pigeon. And I showed him how to make some dough. I'm the guy that took him out of the small time. So what does he do for me? He squawks his head off. And what can I do for him when I see him, huh? 
I'll put him somewhere where he can't get a chance to squeal on anybody else. It's all right with me, Sagari. But if there's one hitch to your plan... Yeah? You're what? not going to see him because I'm sending you up for a nice long stretch for those two jobs you pulled. And if you've got any idea that you're going to get out of it, just forget it. Because you're going right where you belong. Florence Penitentiary. <laughs> September of the same year, John Sagatti and Stanley Borowski were sentenced to from two to ten years in the Florence Penitentiary. Sagatti escaped from the, there in 1929, but his liberty was short, and he was returned in less than a month. Released on parole a year later, he lost no time in returning to his old habits and in 1930 was arrested in Miami after being shot during an attempted robbery. Borowski was also paroled, but he had learned his lesson and is now living a respectable life somewhere in the Midwest. Thank you, Captain McGrath. Independent Rio Grande dealers had a good year in 1936. From all over the Rio Grande territory, reports show sales increases for both Rio Grande cracked gasoline and Sinclair motor oil. And the new year has started off most favorably. For all this, the Rio Grande Oil Company is grateful to you calling all cars fans who have shown your loyalty to the dealers making these broadcasts possible. We hope you will continue to derive pleasure from calling all cars broadcasts. And we hope you will continue to derive increased motoring satisfaction from the products of Rio Grande dealers. Rio Grande Cracked, the Gasolina Police Car Performance, Sinclair Pennsylvania Motor Oil, and Sinclair Opaline, two thoroughly de waxed de jellied lubricating oils, both refinery-sealed in tamper-proof cans. Why not tell your friends about these superior products? We hope, too, you will continue to be entertained by calling All Cars News, that bright, newsy publication so full of screen and radio gossip, detective stories, and other special features. It's about time for a new issue. Keep in touch with your independent Rio Grande dealer. Phoenix Police calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 166 regarding safe robberies. Suspects this case now in custody. That's all. Cotto here is a trained wrestler. We all know jiu-jitsu. Once we are in the car, you will be unable to manage us. True, you have a gun. But you cannot succeed in getting us to the city. I've been thinking about that. Oh, I think uh, you had better accept the uh, Count's offer. It is impossible you will arrive in town alive. Let's put it another way. Let's say that it is impossible that all of us will arrive in town alive. I do not quite understand. It's very simple, really. Don't you see that Koto is the main threat? How much do you weigh, Koto? Two hundred, ten. When you, Count, and Huashi here are carrying Koto through the fields down to where I can call a police car, you won't be very dangerous. But why should they carry me? Because I'm going to kill you. You cannot do that. My dear fellow, I can and will do exactly that. Koto, unfortunately, resisted arrest. My duty as a police officer, although unpleasant, was very plain. I had to shoot him. The law is quite explicit on that point. But I'm not resisting arrest. Oh, you have no imagination, Koto, huh? Who will ever know? You will not do this thing. It is fantastic. Just to show you that my gun is loaded, gentlemen, and that I mean what I say. Please, must be another way. We... 
plead with you, Mr. Jordan. We have been very fair. We have offered you money, wealth. You will not take it. But that is no excuse to murder one of us. I have no desire to kill, but there is one other way. What, please? Koto will lie on the floor of my car. You two will lie on top of him with your hands at my side. If you make a false move, I'll shoot all of you. If you don't, you'll arrive safely at the station. We accept. Into the car, then. And watch your step. This gun is liable to go off in my hand by mistake. One hand on the wheel, the other covering his uncomfortable prisoners, Captain Chitwood transported the dope smugglers to police headquarters. They were speedily tried and speedily sentenced to two and a half years in the federal penitentiary in Leavenworth for violation of the Harrison and Jones Miller Narcotic Acts. Since serving their time for that offense, the Count has been sentenced to Folsom on a verdict of first-degree murder. Koto has returned to Japan, and Awashi is a fugitive from justice, having jumped a bond on a forgery charge. Murder of a soul. Is the fever embraced the flames? In an astonishingly short time, the entire building is gutted. And then a new danger threatens. As one after the other, the walls, lacking any support, sway. Potter and Christ to the street, where a huge crowd of citizens, hurled from their beds by the explosion, are straining at the hastily rigged guard ropes. All night long, the fire rages, completely ruining the plant of the Times. Yet just a little later than usual the next morning, the Times is delivered to its subscribers, printed at an emergency plant by the battered, bruised, and bandaged survivors of the catastrophe. Before the last smoldering ember has died away, the law swings into action. Sam Brown, chief of the district attorney's investigators, and William J. Burns, world-famous detective, team together in a manhunt which extends halfway across America before the McNamara brothers, arch-terrorists, are run to earth and sentenced to life imprisonment. <laughs> Captain Chitwood of the Los Angeles Narcotics Squad was one of the big heroes of calling all cars in 1934. He it was who posed as a dope peddler and met with three wily Japanese high on the top of a hill. His problem was to get the goods on the Orientals and then arrest them and bring them into headquarters. He took his life in his hands. Under his threatening revolver, Captain Chitwood forces the three Japanese to bring the dope up and put it in his car. Although he watches his captives with great care, he cannot but feel the constant threat of Koto's great strength. As the car is loaded finally, he orders the three into the car. In your work, Mr. Jordan, you do not make a great deal of money. Well, it's not very much according to your standards. A sum such as $10,000 would be quite large in your eyes. It would be very large. I happen to have such a sum within easy reach. You'll be able to hire a good lawyer with it. I was thinking of making a friend a present. A very lucky man, I should say. You are the friend, Mr. Jordan. And how do I merit this friendship? You return to the police station with the sad news that your suspects disappeared. Sorry, Count, that's out of my line. Ten thousand dollars is a lot of money. No, you better get in the car. Back there, Kodo. Mr. Jordan, I will give you one more chance. There are three of us. Calling all cars, a Rio Grande presentation. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 58. Stand by for review of preceding broadcast covering murder, bank holdups, and dynamiting. That's all. Rolls and quit. <laughs> Two police officers cruising about their territory tonight in a radio patrol car 
have as their guest a representative of the Rio Grande Oil Company, who is getting first-hand information for the next broadcast of Calling All Cars. Let's listen in. Hey, it's sure good to see the new year come in. 1934 wasn't such a good year for us all. Well, not for all of us, maybe, but so far as Rio Grande was concerned, 1934 was a splendid year. You mean to tell me that you sold more of that Rio Grande crack gasoline last year? I understood most companies were losing business. Oh, no, sirree. Crack gasoline sales have been growing month after month. Well, we've more than doubled our sales. Well, you got a mighty fine gasoline, no question about that. We wouldn't be using Rio Grande cracked in our police cars if it wasn't the finest that the city could buy. Yes, more police cars in California and Arizona are using Rio Grande than any other gasoline. But you know, most of our business comes from new customers, motorists who want to get police car performance in their cars. I imagine that calling all cars radio program creates a lot of new customers for you. Yes, that's right. Nearly every listener is driven in for, to a Rio Grande station to try crack gasoline, and they stick with us. Rio Grande has a mighty loyal following, and the company tries to show its appreciation by giving better broadcasts every week. There's a special program on tonight. Let's listen to it. During the year just past, you have heard broadcast on this program many cases from the police files of Oakland, San Jose, San Diego, Tucson, and other western cities, as well as cases from the files of the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight, we ask you to look back over the past year as we review memorable scenes from Calling All Cars for 1934. In every case of violence and law-breaking, which you will hear re-dramatized on tonight's program, bear in mind that the criminal paid the full penalty prescribed by law. We Westerners have a great tradition to uphold, and the blood of the vigilante seems to flow in our veins. For out here, we have shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that crime does not pay. Do you remember Tom White, the rattlesnake bandit, and his blonde wife and partner in crime, Burma? The very evening that newspapers screamed the headline story that she was on her way to Tehachapi, calling all cars broadcast the dramatization of her career in crime. <laughs> Yes? How do you do, ma'am? We're police officers, and we'd like you to help us. Why, why, come in. Is anything wrong? What can I do? We're looking for a blonde who lives in this building. A blonde? Well, there are several blondes here. Well, who are they? Well, now, there's Miss Arnold. What's she like? Well, I wouldn't want it to go any further, but she's heavy. In fact, she's fat. Yeah, yes. that's, that's not the one. Who else? Well, then there's Miss Gilman. She's 40 if she's a day, though she tries to tell people she's only 32, you know. She's... Well, that's not the one. Oh, yes. Uh, there's young Miss Adams. Hasn't been here very long. Now, what's she like? Well, she's just a child, about 19 or 20, slim and pretty in a way. That's the one we're looking for. What apartment is she in? In 218. Now, look here. I don't want any trouble in my place. We'll... Well, there won't be any trouble. You just stay right here in your apartment. <laughs> Detectives Burris and Bergeron call Detectives Anderson and Maxwell in from the alley. And with guns drawn, climb the stairs to apartment 218. They find the door unlocked. That's her. Grab her, Burris. Hey, Andy. There's that guy down the hall. We're police officers. Get him up. The hell with you. What are they doing? Killing Tom? No, Burma. He just committed suicide by pulling a gun on an officer. Tom White went to a gunman's grave, and Burma White to Hatchapi Women's Prison for from 30 years to life. But this sort of expiation can never bring back the sight of Miss Cora Withington, who was blinded by brutal Tom White's murderous gun. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, a bombing at the Los Angeles Times building. It is one o'clock in the morning of October 1st, 1910. While the city sleeps, a band of men who toil by night and rest by day is working at top speed. From the far corners of the world, another page of history's book has been assembled. The morning paper is going to press. In the composing room on the second floor of the Times building, a line of men, green eye shades clamped to their heads, 
clatter at the linotype machines. In the engraving room on the sixth floor, mercury lamps throw their ghoulish glare. The dog watch in the city room sleepily eyes the clock, hoping that no big story will break to disturb their somnolent ease until 30 comes for them at half past four. Seated by their silent telegraph keys, two men stand by in the wire room for last minute news flashes. In the basement, the huge presses hungrily await the plates for the final edition. Horses and wagons stand ready in the alley to dash away with the ink wet edition to carriers all over the city that Los Angeles may have her news with her morning coffee. The hands of the clock slowly move on. Activity increases as press time approaches. It is now 1-5, In Ink Alley by the press room, another clock ticks ominously, unnoticed by any of the busy workmen in the building. The seconds pass. The clock says 1-7. And then... Ten miles. The center of the Times building blows up. The force of the explosion snaps the girders supporting the second and third floors as so many toothpicks down into the gaping hole hurtle the heavy linotype and stereotyping machinery, carrying their operators to a crushing death. The gas main which feeds the building is ripped open and instantly ignited. A searing fountain of flame leaps through the building. Within a moment, the entire structure is ablaze. Workmen clutched in the freezing maws of horror rush to the fire escapes to be met by a fiery wall, through which escape is an impossibility. The two telegraph editors trapped in the room slowly burn to death. Compositors and linotype operators, horribly maimed, arms torn off and legs broken, lie helpless on the floor as the vicious fire creeps toward them. Their pitiful cries reach the street below, where all the downtown fire apparatus has already arrived. But rescue is an impossibility. No man can enter that seething funeral pyre and live. The reporters and editors on the dog watch in the city room on the third floor are forced to jump to the street. Those who survive the jump are crippled for life. Within a few minutes after the explosion, the last cry of the helpless victims trapped within the building has been smothered